Over the last few years, we've seen this huge resurgence of Reformed theology, Calvinism. Mm. And with my Christian friends who try to convince me of this, I say, listen, like, I don't know why you're trying to persuade me. Hmm. Because your own Bible says it's a gift. that it's a gift, it's the work of the Spirit start to finish, it's a, it's the, a removing of a heart of stone and replacing with a heart of flesh. That is not something you can do for me. Yeah. So if it's true, we're both depending on the Spirit to show yeah. up. I'm literally in the grave next to Lazarus, yeah. waiting, for to the hear, waiting, waiting to hear my name. Yeah. And I'm going to lay in there dead till he shows up. Yeah. Somebody asked me uh, near the beginning of this year of living Christianly, well, what would it take for you to believe? What would it take for mm. you to believe in God? Well, that's easy. God would have to give me faith yeah. Yeah. because um, I can't yeah. reach out and yeah. grab it. What it would take is a miracle. It would take a miracle. Yeah. It and, like, and the Bible what? makes it very clear that there is nothing less spiritually than that going on yeah. in salvation. Absolute new life. New life from death to life. Yeah. And that's what would be required. Yeah. And and I I, I And I'm open to that. it. I'm, I mean I'm oh, literally yeah. I'm literally in the grave waiting to hear my name. Yeah, any time. If, that, if that's the Because if there is gonna be a work of the spirit going on, I want it. And I won't be able to resist it. And yeah. I can't call out for it. Yeah. I cannot coax him over. Yeah. Either my name is written in the book of life or it's not. Yeah. And and I mean so if we're gonna really get into the language, the hard language of the Bible, provocative as it may be, mm -hmm. like I'm had to, I got to a point, I don't like binary ideas or statements, but yeah. there's a few that feel emotionally like they are, yeah. although maybe they're not. But there's a point where I said, you know what, maybe maybe God made me and fashioned me for destruction. Yeah, 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 that's what Because he, he, he says he does that. Jacob I have loved, Esau I have hated, through, for the good pleasure of his own will. That's right, and, and he receives no counsel but his own about yep. that. And so there's nothing I'm going to be able to do to change his mind about it. So maybe it's all real and I'm just not chosen. Hey, welcome back to Living Christian. My name is Jason Brita, and today we're going into the last video in this series of why I am no longer a Calvinist. Thank you so much for sticking around and watching these videos. I hope they've been a blessing and a help to you. And if you are a Calvinist or still a Calvinist, after watching these videos, thank you for taking the time to actually hear a position that is different than yours. Today in this video, we're going to go through a whole host of different reasons why I think there are so many people that are attracted to Calvinism. Toward the end of the video, I want to give my top three reasons as to why I believe people are so drawn to Calvinism. Along the way, we're going to talk about some resources that are helpful from a non-Calvinistic position. I want to give a list of really hard and honest questions that the Calvinist has to wrestle with. If you hold to the Calvinistic doctrines of grace position, these are questions that are going to be good for you to ask, to validate and actually work through, okay, why do I believe what I believe? Is this the truth? These are some questions that you need to ask yourself. So with that, let's dive in. All right, we're gonna dive right into the content, but before we do, just wanna say a few things here, um, and that's just answering the question that many people have asked along the way, is why do this series? I kept getting this question, and I, I thought it was apparent as to why I was doing this series, but I've been getting a lot of people asking, why are you doing this series? You should stop focusing on Calvinism and just focus on the gospel. This is a divisive issue. There's more important things to do, and this is why I wanna say this, is that Calvinism is a Bible-focused issue, okay? There are people that believe in this. There are many people affected by this. If you read a lot of the comments, you're gonna see some of that, where people have walked away from Calvinism and and they have been greatly impacted in a very negative way as a result of being in the Calvinistic position. There's things that I've gotten from you know people, people asking for counsel, people asking for help in what should I do in this situation. Really, this really does matter to people. I think this is a Bible-focused issue. People have been very harsh in some of their comments and what they've said. You know, they, people, I've been called a heretic, I've been called a false teacher, and that's from a Calvinist position or a non-Calvinist position. I'm not being hard enough on Calvinists and some people are thinking I'm going off the deep end and you know don't believe the truth anymore because they don't hold to Calvinism anymore. You know, So there's a whole gamut of things. This is an issue that greatly does matter. It needs to be discussed and addressed. For someone that has walked through really holding on to every nook and cranny of Calvinistic doctrine and theology to now see the scriptures are communicating something different, now believing, doing a, a, 
a complete contrast between the two positions where I can say confidently now that the non-Calvinistic position the position that I've tried to bring out here in this series, I think is the more biblical approach. You know, when we get down to it, we really have to ask the question, there's no gray area in, in some of this stuff. And that's one thing that I've wanted to try to see, where is the gray area here? And when you look at some of the writings in the Bible, the Gospel of John, for example, in the book of Proverbs, you know, there's stark contrast. It's either black or white. You know, there's no gray area. I think when it comes to all of this, doctrine is either true or it's not true. You're either believing something that is the truth or you're believing something that is not the truth. And so that is why this greatly matters because Calvinism is either true or it's not true. And now holding to the position that I believe it's not true, then that has massive implications for what I need to say to other people and how I believe what the scriptures are saying. That's why this matters so much. I want to just tell you up front, I'm going to make some blanket statements because this is probably going to be a very long video and I want to not sidestep anything, but if I if I don't qualify things the way that maybe you would like me to, just please have some grace on that. I might do some things in the future, but I really do not want to focus this whole channel on Calvinism. I want to move on to other important things that I think are going to be edifying to the building up of the body of Christ. Not to say that I won't ever talk about Calvinism again, just know that it's not my heart to just continually talk about this, okay? But it's big enough that I've had to do this series. So here's the video. Why so many believe in Calvinism? Why do so many people believe in Calvinism? Before we go into all the material, I just want to remind you that we have four other videos in this series that you can dive into. They all hit different aspects of the Reformed position, Doctrines of Grace, Calvinism. Again, there's a lot of different titles for what Calvinism is. And so you can look at those videos and they each tackle a different aspect of it. And obviously today's is gonna to be tackling a different aspect as well. Let's dive into our first point this morning which is expository preaching. Now, for the first six of these examples, the first six things I wanna draw out, I wanna talk about the good of these, the bad, and the ugly. Let's talk about what is good about expository preaching. Many Calvinist churches, if not all Calvinist churches, make a strong emphasis on the exposition of the word. This is the line by line, verse by verse teaching of the scriptures. They really do try to hone in on understanding the context of what the passages are talking about about because they believe that the word will do its work. Uh, if you properly teach the word, you effectively get the right message across. It's just as if God is giving it directly to them. And so that the application, even though it's usually drawn out, will just be natural because you're getting the text right. That's what many Calvinist churches do emphasize. And I really think that in many ways, the Calvinist is fervent to get the text right and upholds a contextual, grammatical, historical approach to teaching and preaching. They preach with passion and zeal, and they have a strong desire for people to know God and his word. There are many great preachers, so many preachers that I have respected for years. In so many ways, I've respected their ministries, and even beyond what they talk about in soteriology, especially when I was a Calvinist, there were so many other reasons why I respect them for all the work that they have done. But let's talk about the bad aspect of expository preaching, and this is from a Calvinistic perspective, is that while they do emphasize exposition and exegeting the text, they eisegete certain passages by submitting to the Augustinian interpretation of predestination, election, depravity, and more that's kind of wrapped into the whole doctrines of grace theology. So beyond this, they take other texts and they infer it onto the text that they believe into what limited atonement is, bring that onto the scriptures. They don't draw it out of what the scriptures are saying, they add it into what the scriptures are saying. They use the negative inference fallacy, which we talked about in the previous video, and they insert this and other Calvinistic theology into the understanding of the context. So if you're reading for, as a Calvinist and you get to these specific places in scripture, it's like exegesis just doesn't even matter. Exposition doesn't matter anymore. And I know it matters to them, so don't hear me wrong on that. It doesn't matter because they've already submitted to 
that type of philosophy on those particular passages. By and large, you know, not any fault specifically to their own. They've been taught that that's how you interpret those texts. That's what it is. Now, here's the ugly when it comes to expository preaching. Many congregants of expository preaching churches don't do their own studies. So I'm not talking about the pastors. I'm talking about the individuals, the members, the people that are just the regular attenders, the members of the church coming in, sitting in the pews, and just listening to what the pastor says. They trust their pastors, and that's a good thing that they do that, okay? It is a good thing that they trust their pastors, that they've gotten the text right. Here's the issue. We should also strive to know what the text says. And no matter how logically consistent something does sound, we should never just assume someone's theology because they've done the work. And sometimes that can be a spiritual laziness. That sounds good to me. I'll just believe that's the that to be the case. We should go to the scriptures and validate if these things are true. We really need to do that. I know people who, when asked, what do you believe? Their response has been, oh, whatever MacArthur believes is what I believe. Okay, <laughs> that's that's not good. That's not a good place to be in. We've got men that have been faithful many, many years. MacArthur's been faithful for years upon years of trying to exposit the word and to preach the word. He just submits to the Calvinistic presuppositions systematic when he comes to reading the text in certain areas of the Bible. And when you have that lens, it does actually go into more than just soteriology. It really affects so much of how you see scripture. And so all of that's woven into his interpretation of the scriptures. And because you respect MacArthur and because he's a good orator and, and things like that, you probably just believe, yeah, he probably has the text right. He's the one who's spent hours and hours studying. But again, what I want to emphasize with expository preaching, that if you can exposit the text and spend hours and decades even really grasping the text, but if you're already coming to the text believing that Calvinism is true, you're going to always submit to that when you come to those texts. So my admonition to you is remove that lens, remove that from what you see, and try to go to the text humbly and without those presuppositions in place and really try to see if you know if that's what the text is saying. There's MacArthur. Um, number two reason is heretic fighters. And if you know MacArthur well, you know that he is a heretic fighter. And I think this is actually one of the things that the Calvinist emphasizes in their ministry. I can't tell you how many Calvinistic YouTube channels there are that are out there to expose heresy, false teaching, and all of that. And so when it comes to heretic fighting, let's talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly. So the good is just like Augustine is known for fighting against heretics, Pelagius, Donatus, the Manichaeans, even though he brought that back into later in his life, into then submitting to some of that Manichaean Gnostic philosophy. And many Calvinist reformers fought against the Catholic Church. Today's Calvinists also fight against modern day heretics. Bethel, Hillsong, Jesus Calling, Prosperity Gospel, the New Apostolic Reformation, the Word of Faith movement, and so much more. There are so many sects of Christians that are just not good. If you are a fan of Hillsong or Bethel or any of those things, just know that not everything in what they do is not the truth. But there is enough there that is not the truth that I would warn you to stay away from them. Obviously, there are, you know, still labeled as Christianity, like Jehovah's Witness and Mormons that are definitely not Christian. They're cults of Christianity, but they're not true Christians. Their theology is completely wrong, where the Bethel and the Hillsong and the, and the Prosperity Gospel are also false gospel messages. Uh, they teach a lot of bad theology in them, and I would advise you to stay clear of them. That doesn't mean that if you listen to a Bethel song or a Hillsong song, for example, that every song is filled with heresy. You know, you just want to proceed with caution with some of those things. But in terms of the teaching behind the ministry that, you know, usually the music draws you into, there's a lot of dangerous things that we need to be absolutely discerning for. And so just a warning is that the Calvinist focuses on fighting against heresy. This is a good thing. They are standing up for what they believe is the truth and what is not the truth. Calvinist pastors seem to be some of the loudest when it comes to addressing heresy. 
It's good to be aware and call out heresy where it arises. We're called to test the spirits and see if they are of God, right? 1 John 4, 1. But here's the bad about heretic fighters is that calling out heresy, and I have this in bold and underline if you can see that, is may bring about a spirit that is critical of anything that is not Calvinistic. And that greatly builds up pride in the sense that people feel like they're knowing of all the heresy that a Calvinist is aware of. And because obviously Calvinist, I think wholeheartedly believes that they have the right position and the right interpretation of the scriptures. And then you add on to that, that they're fighting all of this heresy that it can, and it may puff you up in pride that you know the truth and all these other people do not. Now, I will say this, is that all of the things that I just mentioned are things that we need to stand up against. They're not true representations of Christianity, okay? So don't hear me wrong there. Calvinists start to criticize others because they've heard famous Calvinists make derogatory remark, not in love, towards a person or movement that builds pride and diminishes love. You know, we need to stand for the truth, but we need to stand for the truth and speak the truth in love. And I have found that Calvinists are harsh. I think harsh and tone of voice does matter. We need to be firm in this, but they're, they're humans, right? They're, they've made some remarks that I think are just very unchrist-like to do. So what they're doing is good. Uh, how they're doing it in all the ways that they're doing it sometimes isn't very Christ-like. And so that's something I think that's just a bad thing, something to be just careful against. And so while fighting against heresy is good, we need to do it in a loving way. My hope is that this video series is a model for how to do that. Hope that it, I've been able to do that in a model of love. If I'm just yelling in your face, calling you a heretic, you don't believe the truth, you're just a bunch of lies from the pit of hell, you're probably, if you're in that movement, you're probably not going to listen to me. Now, the Lord could use that somehow, potentially, and I think he does in some cases to <laughs> bring people out of wrong theology. By and large, I don't think it's the right thing to do, especially when the scripture tells us that we are to speak the truth in love. Now, the ugly aspect of this is that fighting against heresy has went to extreme unbiblical proportions. Something I wish that I could have had a little bit more time to spend in this video series, the fact that John Calvin officiated the execution of a number of people over heresy. And here are some of the people, probably the most well-known is Michael Servetus. He didn't believe in the Trinity. As a result, he was killed with the approval and oversight of John Calvin. There's Francis Gruet, who opposed Calvinist uh, religious reforms, and he was killed on the watch of John Calvin. Uh, Jacquise Gowett, and I'm probably butchering these names, known for ridiculing Calvin and his supporters. At least he was flogged. I, don't, I actually don't know if he was actually killed. I forgot to write that, that part down, but many people were flogged, beaten. A, lot, a good number of people were murdered and killed as a result of what they, what they stood for if it was against Calvinism. And I know it wasn't called Calvinism back in John Calvin's day, but you know, I'm using that. These are only a few examples. And is that the what Christ would do? And I, and so again, this is what I've this is what I've just this is what's there in history. Um, and there are so many people that put John Calvin on this high pedestal and he, yet he is a murderer going after fellow image bearers not operating in love and it's a big big aspect that needs to be brought out and discussed if you're a Calvinist and this is the first time you're hearing this then that should be a clear warning to you that why has my Calvinistic pastor or Calvinistic conference speaker not brought this up why have they not brought this into the conversation? They've only uplifted his institutes of the Christian religion and all the other works, and he's just this man on this high, high pedestal. This guy had very big character flaws. O outside of his doctrine and theology, which I don't agree with, he had very, very big character flaws that I think if John MacArthur or John Piper or any other person that is here today right now at the time of this video if he was doing these things there would be massive doubts as whether or not this person is a christian or not and so i really do think it needs to be explored more i may do that but i i don't know if i will all right number three your elect this is another reason a big reason why people i think believe in calvinism it is the aspect that you are the elect so here's the good of this god has chosen you in christ okay that's what elect means. From a Calvinistic perspective, 
they believe that God predestined you to be one of the elect, which I don't think is correct. But for those that believe that this is true, there is a sense that God's grace is even more gracious than you originally thought it was. That was the experience I had when I came to Calvinism. Like, wow, God's grace is so much more to me than, than I originally thought it was because God didn't choose everyone to come to him. He has only chosen a few to come to him. Why in the world did he choose me? And it gives this, what's interesting is that it gives this sense that you are special to God for reasons that you can't describe why you are, but you are because he has chosen you. And what it does actually, what's interesting is that uh, there's a clip from Vody Bachman that says what, you know, there's this cage stage moment with Calvinists that they believe that, you know, they gotta, all they do is they talk about God's sovereignty and their election and, you know, all of this stuff. And he said, you gotta put them in a cage in order to uh, wait for them to calm down a little bit and then you can let them out of the cage because uh, they're just so in intertwined with Calvinistic doctrine and theology. It actually puffs people up in pride when it should be doing the opposite, but I actually don't think it should be doing the opposite because if you believe that God has chosen you, you are extra special. You are extra special than all the other people that do not believe in Christ. So there is whether you believe it's something that you did or which I know most Calvinists don't, or you actually think God has chosen you, then there is what well, I see a lot of pride built within Calvinism. Here's the bat, it's a wrong hermeneutic, all right? <laughs> Even though election is mentioned in the Bible, there is never a clear passage that mentions election to salvation. Never, never once. This is what's so amazing to me about so many of the positions that the Calvinist adheres to. Most of it is brought onto the text. It's a presupposition that's brought onto the text. Election to salvation has to be inferred onto the text in order to make it work. It's massively ironic <laughs> that many Calvinists are vehemently opposed to Catholicism, yet their foundation is built off of a Catholic bishop, which is Augustine, who also was influenced by Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, and other philosophers. Okay, so you've, you've got this system that is Calvinism, doctrines of grace, that is built off a man who is a Catholic bishop that adhered to a lot of non-Christian philosophy. I just don't understand. It just doesn't make any sense to me that once you understand and you read into where this all came from, and then so many Calvinists lift up Augustine, lift up John Calvin as these wonderful, great men of the faith. These guys have a wrong hermeneutic and they're, they've dabbled into wrong theology and bad character, and I have no idea why they are upheld as these pinnacles of the Christian faith. The ugly of the aspect of your elect is that many hold to Calvinism often struggle with assurance of salvation. In order to help them feel better or to convince themselves that they are the elect, they are told to view and look at the works. You might have heard of the first John test, a 10 point test of, you know, validate, are you one of the elect? If they can prove through their works that they are bearing fruit, then one can attest that they are one of the elect. Oh, do you love to be around other believers? Do you strive to repent and walk in the light? Like first John tells us, oh, th then, then you're the elect. But there's no real way to truly know if you are elect, because actually what Calvinism was actually founded off of is that God doesn't just grant certain people election, he also grants them perseverance. And if God doesn't grant you the gift of perseverance, then you will not inherit the kingdom of God. So there's really no true way to know that you are really the elect in Calvinism. Calvinism because you could be deceived. You know, at some point down the line, you may fall away. You don't know. Could you be believing a lie for so long that you really are one of the elect and then at some point you see the sin that you're doing and like, oh, I've loved my spouse really well. I've, I've done all these things and, and you know what you're doing? You're pointing back to you. You're pointing back to the works that you're doing to validate if you are saved. That's a work-based theology. If you really, really hone in on it, that's a work-based theology. And it's 
is a terrible thing, we shouldn't be looking to our works and the fruit that we have to validate our salvation. We should be turning and looking to Christ. That's who we should be looking to. Additional effects of the your elect aspect. You're not only elect by God, but also elect by your newfound Calvinistic friends. This is a very emotional part that really affected me greatly. Um, you start listening to all the well-known and popular Calvinist preachers, teachers, speakers, because they are the ones that you should listen to. And if they are not a Calvinist, then you should proceed with great caution, which may just cause one not to look into someone else's teaching out of fear that you'll listen to something heretical. Now, I understand there are a lot of warnings against, again, you know, heretic fighters, there's warning against certain people. You're, you're not going to hopefully have a Joel Osteen book in your church's bookstore just so that you can vet whether or not they're good or not. Like, you know, I think most Christians should really know that, that Joel Osteen is not teaching the Bible. <laughs> he, well, he's teaching his view of the Bible, but it's not the true Bible. All right. So, but even the Calvinist leaning conferences, such as the former Together for the Gospel, is really together for Calvinism because the only pastors and speakers that lead and speak are Calvinists. So are they really there for the gospel or are they there for their Calvinism? And then it gets into this idea that Calvinism is the gospel. And I might, I'm going to talk about that later. If you're not strong in your faith, this could really affect you emotionally and mentally. Here's where it's kind of hit home for me. There have been so few people that have continued to stay connected. All right, let's talk about number four, apologetics. The good. We are called to give a defense for the hope that is within us. 1 Peter 3.15. There is a faithfulness to be obedient to the word in this way, and there are numerous ministries, Calvinistic ministries, that I have personally benefited from throughout my time as a Calvinist. You saw Greg Kokel. He's a five-point Calvinist. He runs Stand to Reason. There are a lot of good resources that I valued from him because apologetics doesn't always focus on soteriology. There are a lot of things that, uh, I don't know if I actually have this in this in this, in this lineup, but there are ministries that focus, they don't really emphasize on Calvinism, but you learn over time that they are a Calvinist. So it just kind of adds to the weight of like, oh, it's true. You know, like look at this great ministry that doesn't focus on Calvinism, but oh, I've come to find out that they are a Calvinist. So it's, it is another element. Uh, Wretched Radio, Answers in Genesis. To my best understanding, Ken Ham is a Calvinist. And I've greatly valued, I mean, like my family goes to the Ark, I think almost every single year. <laughs> so there's so much that's good within that, just trying to bring our kids to just in any way, shape or form to the Bible. One of the best advices that I've had as a parent given to me is that you're either pointing your kids to Christ or you're not. So in every decision, everything that you make, are you doing that? That's how we should live our life too, right? Think about these things. There can be a lower fear of man since the systematic is built on God saving his elect and only his elect will hear the voice of the good shepherd. Uh, so I will say that apologetics and evangelism, there was a lot more fear in me personally it, as a non-Calvinist prior to becoming a Calvinist and that did actually curb some of that fear of man. It is the gospel that's the power of God unto salvation, not elect. And so what I needed was just better theology and I needed more practice into evangelizing people, having answers for certain things. So why was there a flood and how do you prove this? And, you know, archaeologists have found this and there's contradictions in the Bible. You know, there's so many aspects to apologetics that are good for us to know. I just lack that information. That's that's what was really lacking. I think in some respects, there's always going to be some fear of man that we need to ask the Lord to help us with, but it wasn't the Calvinistic perspective that helped me in, in the long run. It was me sharpening my sword. That was what was needed. Here's the bad of apologetics. Many Calvinists are apathetic when it comes to apologetics. Many are more concerned about their own spiritual growth, deepening their well of theology and doctrine rather than defending the faith that they hold to. That's, again, this is my perspective. Your perspective may be totally different, but this is what I have seen and what I have heard from other people that have been in this. Many are combative and prideful online, not showing Christ-like character in their words and their speech. All right, let's go into number five, the Calvinist gospel. The good of the Calvinist gospel, I know that's kind of weird for me to say and for probably weird for you to hear me say that. Many are faithful to share the good news of what Jesus has done. Many try 
to include a call to repent in every service or try to insert a gospel call in every teaching or preaching that they do. Because they do love the Lord, and I think because many of them are compatibilists, where there's just this element of mystery, where I'm holding to what the Bible says because that's what the Bible says. And this is very much a MacArthur type of view. I believe that man has free will and Jesus wept over Jerusalem and all these things. I believe all of it because the, because the Bible says it, but God is also sovereign over all of those things. And he elects and predestines certain people to salvation. And that's true because the Bible teaches it. How you put that together? I have no idea. It's a mystery. So the compatibilist holds to a lot of aspects of true Bible theology, Bible doctrine, Bible truth, while then also believing in a Gnostic, Manichaean, Stoic philosophy that I think is very, very dangerous. And then it actually merges, which is also crazy because, well, I'll talk about this later about biblical counseling, but maybe it's a good point to just bring up right here is that biblical counseling really emphasizes on using the word as the authority. Second Peter 1, 3 tells us we have all that we need for life and godliness. That is found in the word. And what Christian psychology has done is that they bring in the Bible and they bring in secular psychology that has built off of a foundation of there is no God, a very atheistic worldview, and that man is good from the start and it's our conditions that affect us. It's not our personal sin. And so you have two competing worldviews trying to merge together. And that's what a lot of Christian counseling is, where biblical counseling focuses on just using the word biblical language to, to get to the root and the heart of the person and to help them using the word that way. So in the same sense, that's what the compatibilist is doing though, is they're like the Christian counselor. They're trying to take the Bible and then philosophy and merge it together. And uh, many fall into that trap. Many Calvinists do not preach the gospel and how they understand it. You don't hear many Calvinists say, repent and believe, and you will only repent and believe if you're the elect. So just know that if God didn't predestine you to salvation, you are elect. But I'm calling you to repent and believe because that's what the Bible has told me to do. They, they don't communicate the gospel that way, right? They don't say, if you're elect, you can be saved, or Jesus died for the world, but that really just means all kinds of people. It doesn't mean all people. Um, so if you are one of those special people that God did actually save through his atoning work just for you because you might be the elect, then you will believe. He'll grant you regeneration and faith and you will believe. That's not what we're ever commanded to do when, when it talks about the Great Commission or sharing Christ. There's no examples in the Bible. Of that's how we're to do it. So they, they well, that's what we're, we're not told to do it that way. But if you really believe it, why would you not? So while I'm thankful that they do preach the true gospel in many respects, I do not like the fact that they hide what they really believe when presenting the gospel to others. They really are holding back on what they truly believe. And I think, I think that's just deceptive. I don't think that's good. I did the same thing when I was a Calvinist. If I was sharing my faith with anyone, I never brought up the element that I might be talking to to them who is not elect, that God only does save some people. I never brought that element up. Maybe you do. I think you're consistent if you do. The ugly aspect of Calvinist gospel is that many Calvinists believe the tulip is the gospel. I have had numerous people I know personally and people online that have said in various ways that by not believing in Calvinism, you are not saved. Oh, okay. Well, when you make statements like that, you're, what you're saying is that Calvinism is the gospel. You have to hold to, and then what, what aspect of Calvinism is it? Is it, is it the T? Is it the U? Is it the L? Is it the I? Is it the P? Is it all five points? If I'm a four point Calvinist, I don't know the gospel. I'm not saved. Like what, what, do people mean when they say this? And I think they're all coming from a different perspective, but I think that's incredibly, incredibly dangerous. And if you see anyone making statements like that online or in person, pray for them because if they believe that Calvinism is the gospel, they, they've got a false gospel. Some people have actually said that because I've walked away from Calvinism, that I'm probably going to deconstruct and their time spent with me to actually hear why I now believe what I believe isn't going to be valid. They need to validate after years down the road, undetermined amount of time, maybe, perhaps, who knows, that I'm still a Christian. I'm still walking with Jesus. It's just, that that's amazing to me. I've been called a heretic, a false teacher. I've been called Satan as a result of walking away from Calvinism. 
Many can have a hyper can have hyper tendencies which result in not proclaiming the gospel because God will save his elect no matter what. I think that there's an element of that. And I will say this is that I think there's many people that understand what a hyper Calvinist is and would say they're not a hyper Calvinist. In their mind, they're not a hyper Calvinist, but in practice, they have hyper Calvinistic tendencies to how they do things and how they treat people. Number six, hermeneutics and presuppositions. Let me say that hermeneutics is the study of principles of interpretation. So having a good hermeneutic is vitally important when it comes to the scriptures. We all have presuppositions when we come to the text of scripture. We just need to make sure that we do not bring those presuppositions onto the text, but let the text draw out what is in the text, right? Many Calvinists strive for a deeper knowledge of the word, and that is great. That's a great thing. The bad is that many Calvinists start with the Augustinian presuppositions such as predestination, election, total depravity, limited atonement, regeneration preceding faith, and many more, and they insert that theology onto the text. They've been taught that's what it means, so therefore they submit to that's what it means. You can see those examples if you go to my previous videos. The ugly of this is that many Calvinists are closed to being taught. They have the knowledge that they have and there's no way, shape, or form that they can be taught anything else. They believe their presuppositions so strongly that they are unwilling to let them go to verify if that's what the scriptures clearly communicate. Many Calvinists, even though they have not actually worked out the text themselves, believe so strongly that they are right. This most likely stems from their belief that other Calvinist preachers have the text correct and they buy the logic that they put out to affirm Calvinism, the doctrines of grace is true. Calvinistic logic and arguments. Calvinists have many compelling arguments that they impose on to others, which for the untrained and the unlearned can sound very convincing. Take this one for example. If there are people in hell that Christ died for, talking about the atonement, his sacrifice wasn't sufficient. I believe that Christ's sacrifice was sufficient for all whom it was intended for. There's not one person in hell that Christ didn't die for. That's the argumentation for limited atonement. That sounds really good on the surface, and it's very hard if you don't know how to respond to that. We're dead in our trespasses and sins. What does dead mean? Dead means dead. So how can anyone who is dead respond to God? How would you answer that question? I'd love to hear your comments to those. If you are non-Calvinist, how would you respond to those things? Look at the golden chain of redemption, Romans 8, 28 through 30. Do you think God does not work in this way? The golden chain of redemption in Romans 8, like, I don't know how you get around that. Again, they've never learned what the text means outside of their reform position. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Prove me wrong. They lay the burden of proof back on the non-Calvinists to prove what they believe, but do they really want to listen? In many cases, I've found they don't. The Calvinist knows how to defend their understanding of Romans 9, Ephesians 1, Acts 13, 48, and many more, which many non-Calvinists, I'll just say, are not confident how to respond. You know, the non-Calvinist has believed the true gospel but they've not really been intertwined with what Calvinistic doctrine and theology is. So when they hear it, the arguments that Calvinists have and the logic that they have to bring about their cases are massively strong. And for the unlearned and the untrained, it's hard for them to combat that because they've not had to do that. They've not learned how to work through the scriptures in that way before or how to really pick apart why that is not true. Now, thankfully, thanks to YouTube and other resources that way, there are more voices coming out. The more that I've posted these videos, the more YouTube is recommending other people that believe as I do in many respects. And so that's been encouraging that there are a lot. Going back to just the way that the YouTube algorithm works, if you start looking at the other side and really listening to what other people are saying, it's not just like one voice over here. It's not just Leighton Flowers. <laughs> Okay, it's not just Soteriology 101 that is the non-reformed position of understanding the text. There's so many others. Calvinism is taught. R.C. Sproul admits that when he was in seminary, his professor wrote on the board, regeneration precedes faith. 
and thus began the indoctrination of Calvinism into or onto R.C. Sproul. John MacArthur, who if you listen to his older sermons, preached and teaches not like a Calvinist at all. Then you will find clips, I'm going to play them here in a moment, of John MacArthur admits that it was R.C. Sproul that influenced him. He was accused by John Piper of being a classic Calvinist. Take a look at this video. Put Puritan sermons at the back, and I can't remember what you said. I said, are you a five-point Calvinist? This is in front of 500 guys. I've never heard him say this. And he said, yes. And I said, how come nobody knows that? <laughs> and, and you said something like, well, the older you get, the more free you are to say what you think, or something like that. Well, I was just going to say regarding the great-grandchildren, I'm trying to move them from M&Ms to five-point Calvinism. That's, that's a good way to do it. Yeah. yeah. Started talking like a five-point Calvinist and throwing labels around. I didn't want to cut the cords. I, I wanted to bring them along. And I thought the only way I can bring them along is to bring them along exegetically and expositionally without unpacking everything in labels that would put barriers up. So it took me a long time. Um, basically, uh, RC would ask me the same question. Because I spoke at a Ligonier conference and I was really outside their world. Totally outside their world. And I asked RC, why are you doing this? I said, I want you to speak on election because I want to know what you believe. <laughs> that is absolutely the truth. The first time I was at a Ligonier conference, he, he gave me the subject of election and I said, why are you doing that? You invented that doctrine. And he sat on the front row with his little glass of Coke and his feet crossed like this, waiting to hear what I said <laughs> at, at his own conference about election. And um, all I can say is I was prepared. <laughs> and that was my coming out on Calvinism. I don't know anyone personally that came to Calvinism that was not taught Calvinism first. In fact, every Calvinist I know has admitted that they were an Arminian first. So many pastors went to seminary or taught by their church pastors on how to pastor and shepherd people and how to preach Christ. Many of them taught Calvinism. Others who went through other pastoral schooling was not taught Calvinism and why it's not biblical or how to refute Calvinism or exposit the text correctly. Okay, so there's there's a lot of there that I could unpack, but probably not going to just for sake of time. There are tons, plethora of Calvinistic resources, commentaries, books, conferences, seminaries, churches, study Bibles, Bible translations that have Calvinistic leanings within them and it is rampant. I'm going to go into more of this as to why it's become so popular here just ahead. Bible translations in Exodus interprets harden a particular way, and they change the root word to mean harden in Exodus. It's suspect, okay? I'll just say that. If we really truly care about the original words, the original Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic words, we need to know what those words are, and we need to be good Bereans to study those words, to really know, is this drawing out the text correctly? Is this translation drawing out the text correctly? That's that's all I'm saying with that. Uh, Revelation 13, 8. Some people have asked, okay, well, Show me a proof in the ESV. Revelation 13, 8 mistranslates before the foundation of the world. It actually is from the foundation of the world when it talks about in that verse, not before. And funny enough is that the ESV later uh, in chapter 17 or 17 or 18 also uses from the foundation of the world. And it, the same word, they translate it correctly in chapter 17 or 18. They don't in chapter 13, verse 8. The Legacy Standard Bible, which I do actually 
appreciate many respects and aspects of the Legacy Standard Bible. Believe it or not, if I use a Bible translation outside of the NKJV or the KJV, it's probably going to be the Legacy Standard Bible. Okay, so just know that, but I am aware that they have Calvinistic leanings. And the two that I've caught so far is Daniel 7, 14. Go ahead and read it. You'll, you'll see what I mean. And Jude 1, the expression that God has saved a people for himself, save a people for himself, is a Calvinistic expression, just so you know. It's a way to say that God hasn't saved everyone, which God doesn't save everyone, but he, he did die for everyone, and all that do come to him will be saved, versus the Calvinistic perspective that God only saves the elect. That's what that's where they get that God has saved a people or he saves a people for himself. That's Calvinistic lingo. All right, piety. This is a big, big point. This is also a very philosophical point, not a biblical point, is that many Calvinists appeal to piety to defend their claims that the doctrines of grace is true. And just because they see the God of scripture through that Calvinistic lens does not mean that is who God is. Okay, that, so we need to be very, very clear when it comes to this. Piety is a big, big deal. Well, in my third video really talks about this a lot when it talks about God's sovereignty, decretal theology. I believe God is so sovereign that he controls every minuscule molecule. That's how sovereign God is. I actually think that's a low view of God's sovereignty. What's a high view of God's sovereignty is that God has created man in his own image with the ability to make choices, to have a free will, and God is still ruling and reigning and in control even through humans having the free will. God is more sovereign in that way. If God, if God's sovereignty means that he has to meticulously control everything, that's not sovereignty, that's control. <laughs> okay, let's get our definitions correct. The Bible never has the word sovereignty in the Bible. And I talk about that in my third video as well. Watch that video if anything I just said sounds like it's new information or you want to explore that more. There is heady new language to learn. Confluence. Anthropomorphic. Sufficient but not efficient. Effectual call versus general call. And here's some funny things here. Catholicism is what Arminianism leads to. Emergent, synonymous for heretic. <laughs> uh, everyone means the elect. All mean the elect. Whosoever means the elect. Cosmos is a Greek word that means the elect, not world. Faith, given to the elect after regeneration. Faith is also, in a Calvinistic lens, is also a work that gives pride to Arminianism. God's secret will is that he saves the elect. God's revealed will is a mystery. <laughs> I'm gonna butcher this word. Infralapsarianism, it's a four point Calvinist. Supralapsarianism, God orchestrated the fall for his glory and this, and this is the central truth of the scripture. So there's a whole new language and definitions that you have to learn when it comes to Calvinism. And because it's many, many of it's philosophical, many of it is Gnostic, all these men know all these things that I just don't know about the Bible. Man, I got to trust what they know because they know so much more than I do. There's so many titles for Calvinism, Calvinism, Reformed theology, Augustinianism, the doctrines of grace, Reformed tradition, Protestantism, Reformed Christianity, Reformed just in general, Tulip, there's a strong emphasis on God's sovereignty. All of that is wrapped up within Calvinism. There's so many types of Calvinists. There's five pointers, four pointers, three pointers. There's determinists, there's compatibilists, there's Dorian, there's neo-Calvinists, there's the new Calvinists, there's hyper-Calvinists, there's high Calvinists. Calvinism hit the internet and media by storm. Okay, as the internet was becoming a thing, now it's prevalent now, but as it was becoming a thing, there was something going on. Tim Challies, who is a Calvinist, his perspective believes that the resurgence of Calvinism came from the church growth movement that weighed heavy on pragmatism. A response to the church growth movement has was twofold. This is what he says. First, this is where the emergent church came from. They downplayed doctrine and theology and focused on community and authenticity. Rob Bell is one of the leaders in this movement. We all know Rob Bell now is not walking in the truth. He became Oprah's spiritual leader and he's he rejects the aspect of um, hell and he's walked away from many tenets of, of the Bible. And I know people personally that have been greatly devastated by that whole situation. 
The second movement was the resurgence of Calvinism. It did focus on doctrine and theology, albeit Reformed theology. We saw the rise and growth of R.C. Sproul, John MacArthur, John Piper, D.A. Carson, Mark Dever, Albert Moeller, etc. These men raised up new leaders such as Kevin D. Young, David Platt, Matt Chandler, and many others. And, you know, and then all of these other voices that were fighting against the emergent movement that was not a good movement... You know, they had some good tendencies to be authentic and focus on community. Those are good things. But then they got so much wrong and steered away from much of what the Bible is true. Then you have these other others that focus on doctrine and theology and uh, all of that. So conferences such as Together for the Gospel and the Gospel Coalition were founded to help grow the movement as a result of that movement. And as a result, that movement grew. Publishers recognized the movement and more, and more and more books were being published from men who held the Calvinist position. All the while, Christians, not keen on what Reformed theology is or was, knew the church movement lacked integrity, and the emergent church turned liberal, and true believers were looking for pastors to stand firm on the truth of the scriptures, men who would not cave into the culture, fall prey to the seeker-sensitive movements that many churches were falling into at the time. Now you got your Bill Hybels, your Rick Warrens that focused a lot on seeker-sensitive pragmatism. We got away from the word. We started focusing more on topical series messages, shorter sermons, not exposition of the word. And the Calvinists came in and said, no, we got to focus on the word. We got to focus on doctrine and theology. We're going to do expositional preaching. And they grew as a result of this because that's what true Christians were really seeking after. I think some Christians fell into the pragmatic, the emergent, the seeker sensitive stuff because, hey, this is new, it's different. You know, they're trying to bring people to Christ, but how they're doing it in many ways was just wrong. Like let's let's appease the world to bring them in. The end goal is to bring people into the church. Great. The means in which they did that to do that, wrong. Calvinists didn't do that to their credit. The internet was struck by a windstorm of Calvinism led by what I believe was R.C. Sproul through his ministry, Ligonier Ministries. John MacArthur, who if you listen to his older sermons, was a closet Calvinist, or not a Calvinist like he is today at least. Calvinist preachers are dynamic communicators, passionate for the Bible, devoted to exposition, heresy fighters, desire to proclaim Christ, lovers of theology and doctrine, many with ministries that have helped, bless, and encouraged many through their efforts and their ministries. Yet, it's all done with the lens of Calvinism inserted into what they do, okay? They have Gnostic philosophy embedded into the Bible, which is no better than any anti-Christian cult offshoot that adheres to non-biblical presuppositions. Okay, Jesus is not the spirit brother of Satan like the Mormons believe, right? You wouldn't insert that into the Bible. Why are we inserting Calvinism into the Bible? I have to say this. If you watch my third video, I share why I think most Calvinists are compatibilists and and that many proclaim the true gospel. They, they are brothers and sisters in Christ, but they submit to Gnostic philosophy with believing this is cor the correct interpretation of the scriptures. They have many faithful pastors that affirm these people have their interpretation correct, Many because, mainly because they have been taught by them. You think that you're smarter than John MacArthur or Jonathan Edwards? These are questions I've like specifically been, been given. You think you're smarter than, than Albert Moeller? To which I reply, no, absolutely not. I, I, I'm, <laughs> I just don't take the Calvinistic interpretation of the text of scripture when I read it, okay? Like that's what I see. Uh, just because they've got a platform and many people follow them, does not mean that they are true. That's an appeal to authority. Yeah, they've been faithful in their ministry for a long time. That's great. I have less time in, under my belt. I have less influence under my belt. That doesn't mean anything. That, doesn't, that, that in and of itself does not equate that they have it correct. Certain men are placed on a pedestal, and it's almost, it almost is a kind of worship of these men. I have seen countless people put John Calvin and Martin Luther on these theological pedestals, and it's given the appearance of almost of, a, of an idol worship. One of the Together for the Gospel conferences that I went to, 
there was a whole section devoted to Martin Lloyd-Jones and his ministry that came off to me as a form of worship for his accomplishments. It hit me as like, this is not healthy for us to be focusing so much towards one man. Like, this is together for the gospel. Why are we focusing on one man's ministry and really putting them on this pedestal? You know, it, so it never hit me right. There's a clip that can be found of Legan Duncan at Grace Community Church. I'm going to show it here in a minute. Telling an audience member how to understand the will by advocating the book by Martin Luther. This question is a good question. It comes up repeatedly, not only from the time of Pelagius, it came up with the Wesleys. But this was one of the, the John Wesley's arguments against Calvinism. And Luther's little book, The Bondage of the Will, which I'm sure is in the bookstore, is all about this question. And don't think that you won't be able to understand it. You'll be able to understand it perfectly if you pick up the book. The whole book is devoted to answering this question. Uh, my, my question is distilling. Uh, is that grace available to everyone, then? God's help to be saved? You mean regenerative grace? Mm -hmm. No. Wrong. That's what, that's what uh, the whole point is that God is not obligated to give saving grace to anybody. And he sovereignly determines to, be, to have mercy upon whom he will have mercy. Wrong. And that is his prerogative. The answer Lincoln gives is not, it will be clear if you continue to search the scriptures why God only calls all people to repent but doesn't aid them in that. The answer is this, it will be clear if you learn how to interpret the Bible the way a Calvinist interprets the Bible. That's how it will help you. You don't need the Bible. You need this book on this man who believes in Calvinism to teach you how to believe in Calvinism. That's basically what it is. Calvinism in churches. Many people have seen men who preached expositionally, who loved the word of God, who cared about doctrine and theology, and men who didn't come straight out and let you know what Calvinism really is. Many Christians that have come into Calvinism were not given a crash course on what Calvinism is. They desired the meat of the word and found Calvinism. For many Christians that desires the meat of the word, expositional preaching is a breath of fresh air. And it, it was absolutely for me. I left a church that was very topical, very spiritual milk. They, you know, they had the gospel right, moved into the church that I came to that was Calvinistic. And I felt like I was a sponge. I wanted to learn. They, like I learned more in one service than the, probably a year and a half at the previous church I was in. This higher ground of doctrine, this deeper understanding of the word is desirable for Christians. They want to know the word because they love Jesus. They want to worship him and, and know him more and more. There's a drawing to deeper theology. There is a fascination for humans to know more and more. This is why knowledge is such a heavily pursued path for so many. People desire to know things, right? That's just who we are. It may be knowing from an experience standpoint or knowing from facts so that you can be properly informed. How many movies or shows are built on the element of mystery and unfolding the secret knowledge of the truth, right? Uh, every cop movie or, or mystery, who done it, how they do it, all of that stuff. It's fascinating to people, right? Whether it's unsolved mysteries, learning the outcomes of your favorite character, the revealing of a makeover, we're working on this stuff, they don't really show you, but then at the end they give this big reveal, wow, look at that. It's this, it's this desire to know and know and know more and more things. The element of mystery and secrets are fascinating. It's a fascinating pursuit for humans to embark on. This spills into the religious realm greatly. Look at all the religions out there that are appealing to the mystery of what they hold to as the truth. How many Christians are looking for an experience with God and they find the charismatic movement that scratches the itch of the mystery of experiencing God through various feelings or self-proclaimed healings, right? How many TV evangelists market that they have a secret to knowing God more or experiencing his presence through prayer or healing? Calvinism scratches this element of this secret knowledge, but just in a different way. Calvinism makes you feel like you just successfully entered deep waters and you only 
have ever previously tipped your toes in the shallow area of the ocean of the biblical knowledge that there is. Oh, wow, there's so much more depth that I didn't realize. God has only saved the elect. You feel like you have finally found the truth of the scriptures that you've been searching for. That's the way it felt for me, especially if you were, if you're brought up in a church that had the gospel, but not much more. And you go to a church that seems that they have more meat on the bones of the scriptures. And in many cases they do, but then they teach Calvinism to you. Oh, that's what the scriptures are communicating because the systematic is logical. It appears as if it's also biblical. Calvinism's logical. I will affirm that all day, every day. They have worked out the systematic. They have strong argumentations as to why is there. You can definitely say that Calvinism is, is logical. Absolutely. But is it biblical? And that's where I would say, no, it's not. Biblical words, philosophical definitions. The non-Calvinist adheres to words like election, predestination, chosen, sovereign, ordained, decreed, hardened, etc. because they are biblical words. The non-Calvinist just does not subscribe to the Gnostic philosophical definitions that Augustine brought in to this. Calvinism in churches. R.C. Sproul came out one of his broadcasts and explained Calvinism and the need to share it with the world more boldly. While I'm thankful for those who do not hide what they hold to doctrinally, this is not always the case. In fact, there are numerous strategies for converting churches over to Calvinism. I personally know of a handful of churches where there was a five-year plan to switch to the doctrines of grace theology. I know of churches that have split as a result of moving to a Calvinist bent in theology. Many church leaders and pastors see the move to convert people over to Calvinism as holding to the true biblical narrative. However, I do find it ironic that many do not come straight out and boldly profess this. They use doctrines of grace and sovereignty instead of the phrase Calvinism. Many are aware of the controversy that comes with adhering to Calvinism, and so they don't come out and speak about it plainly. They are sensitive to how they communicate it to people, and not that we shouldn't be sensitive to how we communicate to people, but this can be done, and it can be done in a loving way, but it is also a way to not be open and transparent with those who are curious. I've said this already in my one of my previous videos, like, you hear the doctrines of grace. What Christian does not believe in grace? If you don't know that the doctrines of grace is a code word for Calvinism and adhering to that, you're going to fall prey to it. Oh yeah, I believe in grace too. Oh, yeah, I believe that God's grace and what he's done for us. And that gets into the sad reality of stealth Calvinism. There's a channel you can look up called Beyond the Fundamentals. He has a couple videos on this pastor named James Ross, who it has come about that this this pastor is in the midst of being taken out of his church because he came in professing that he was not a Calvinist, but he is absolutely preaching Calvinism in his messages. And the people were catching on and they were like, what is going on here? Sadly, there are some men that purposefully have accepted a pastoral job at a non-Calvinist church declaring that they are not a Calvinist, blatantly lying. And then they try to get the job with the intent to shift the congregation over to Calvinism. Again, this is a very unchristian like thing to do. It's a very pragmatic, like the means of not disclosing the truth will justify the ends because they will truly know the truth after I really take them through Calvinism. My appeal to you, Calvinist pastor, is this. Be upfront and be honest with others. Do not hide your theology from others. God will not bless your ministry by sneaking and being deceptive about what you believe. This goes for anything, not just Calvinism, okay? But specifically to those who are going into churches and trying to convert people to Calvinism through the scriptures, it's deceptive. Don't think that God doesn't know that you're being deceptive. If you truly wholeheartedly believe that you have the truth, then you stand on it firmly, boldly, transparently, openly, honestly with the people that you have. And that's what you need to do. Nine Marks is a church identifying website that upholds what they label as a biblical church model. If you hold to these nine marks, then you are a solid church. There's an article on their website that is called Preach the Bible, Not Calvinism by P.J. Tobian. 
It is filled with wordplay on how to communicate that you're not a Calvinist when you really are. It is an article that promotes a compatibilist position where the preacher only wants to be biblical, and by biblical, it advocates for Calvinism and appeals to the mystery I speak about in video three of my series. So let me say that again. The article, even though it says preach the Bible, not Calvinism, is actually telling, it's communicating, just preach the Bible through the Calvinistic lens. <laughs> it's so ironic. It's so incredibly almost laughable. If you're a Nine Marks affiliated church, don't preach Calvinism, just preach the Bible. But really what they're doing is you're preaching the Bible through the Calvinistic lens because those that are adhered to the Nine Marks, I, mean, I don't know every single church that is on Nine Marks, but the ones that I have explored and looked through, they hold to Calvinism. Uh, so, so suffice to say, it's hard to find a good Bible teaching church. Just in general, it's hard to do that. So these nine marks appear to be a good standard to follow. However, if you use this church locator, you will find that they recommend Calvinistic churches. So again, just to be aware of that. How do you find a good church? Nine marks is probably going to pop up. It's very popular. You're going to go to it. Okay. I I know people like, how did you find your church? Uh, I went, I went and used nine marks. Their church is a Calvinistic church. And so it's, it's an identifier. And again, for the untrained, the unlearned, you would not know. You just want to find a good church. These nine tenants look good. There's nothing in those nine tenants that explicitly communicates Calvinism. And so there is this, again, you know, I don't want to judge motives or anything else, but it's just funny that they don't come out and say, we are a Calvinist leaning ministry. The churches that associate with us are also Calvinist leaning. Again, they're not upfront with this stuff. And I, I get it in, in the back of their mind, they're probably thinking this is the biblical view, so we don't really need to qualify all of this stuff. But when, we, when you know what Calvinism really is, it needs to be proclaimed up front. You need to be open and honest up front about this stuff. Okay, next, cognitive dissonance is a concept that refers to the discomfort or tension that arises when a person holds to two contrary beliefs, attitudes, or values. This is what I believe happens to most Calvinists. They appeal to mystery. God is completely sovereign over every minuscule molecule and humans have responsibility and is culpable for their sin. I don't know how God works in this way, but it's true. It's a cognitive dissonance. It's not logically consistent. It's not proper hermeneutics. It's not proper exegesis with what the scriptures communicate. Let the little children come to me. Matthew 19, 13 through 15, Luke 18, 15 through 17, Mark 10, 13 through 16, all give the same account for what I see is the heart of Jesus with image bearers. Luke identifies these children as infants in verse 15 of Luke 18. The laying on of hands was symbolic for a special blessing and dedication. Uh, we see that in Genesis and Numbers. The children were brought despite of the opposition of the crowd and specifically the apostles. Oh, these children are coming. Jesus, Jesus, why, why, why? And Jesus gently corrects them. Let the little children come to me. The little children were too young to understand the importance of being blessed by Jesus. You know, these are infants. They're probably under the age of two years old. Their age made no difference to Jesus. Jesus didn't say, let all these elect children come to me. He said, let the little children come to me. The parents cared for their children and desired to bring them to Jesus. Jesus did not turn any of them away. And I think that's the heart of Jesus. Like, and he goes on to say that you need to you need to have faith like a child. There's references of coming to Christ like a child. The Calvinist has this heady knowledge, this super deep well of philosophy and, and doctrine that you need to understand all this stuff. When you look at the thief on the cross, knew absolutely nothing theological <laughs> um, other than that I'm putting my faith and trust in this this man who's on this third cross here with me. You are the son of God. Jesus is saying, let the little children come to me. I am not casting out even what society would say is the least of these. The least of these. Jesus came in the flesh as a child. <laughs> He's let the little children come to me. These little children have no idea the magnitude of him blessing them. But this is the heart of God. Life is given by God. Every child belongs to God. God gives us children and entrusts us with caring for them. 
Why would God entrust his image bearers with the stewardship of other fellow image bearers if the ultimate purpose of God was not to save the majority of his image bearers that he granted them life for? Why? If your answer is Romans 9, vessels for wrath and vessels for mercy, watch my previous video where I, sh I show expositionally why Romans 9 does not advocate reprobation in the way that the Calvinist views it. False dichotomies. <laughs> you, you'll, funny, you'll see John Piper says seven-point Calvinist there at the bottom. There's no such thing as a seven-point Calvinist, but he has referenced himself as a seven-point Calvinist. That's why it's there. Um, it, it just means that he he is like, he is Calvinist to the bone. There can be no one that's further in Calvinism than John Piper. So false dichotomies. This is a big one too. It's either Calvinism or Arminianism. Wrong. That's not true. <laughs> um, Arminianism is diet Calvinism. It's Calvinism light. That's what Arminianism is. They still start with total depravity. Romans 9, along with 90% of the other Calvinist proof texts claim the text is either their view of salvation or a different view of salvation or soteriology. So Romans 9 is either the Calvinistic view or it's the Arminian view, which is by and large what they tend to do. And they advocate that you either have a Calvinist bent or an Arminian bent. God is sovereign or he's not sovereign. Okay, come on. I mean, like, really? He's either sovereign or he's not sovereign? Okay, we believe that God is sovereign, but we don't believe that God is meticulously controlling, arbitrarily selecting certain people, all right? that's We have a different definition of what sovereign means, which is more accurate to what sovereign actually means than what Calvinism says sovereign is. Man can either save themselves or God has to be the one who saves them. Again, a false dichotomy. This is, that's not true. It's either man doing the saving or God doing the saving. Well, who does the saving? God does. God effectually atones for his elect or his atonement is for all, which means that Jesus is a universalist. No, again, that's so wrong, okay? But if you believe in the Calvinistic lens, you probably have heard a lot of these false dichotomies. Children's programs. You see the New City Catechism, you see Adventure Club, mo both are laden with Calvinistic doctrine. To teach kids at a young age when they don't even really know how to even grasp some of this stuff, which, why some, I think, Calvinist churches don't emphasize this stuff. When when kids are small, they bring it out when they're much older. In some cases, it's not till the college and career phase that this really starts becoming uh, prevalent. But children's programs. Some churches are soft when it comes to Calvinism towards children's programs, while others will catechize from the start as early as possible. I know of some personally who share with me their child went through a period of sleepless nights and throwing up because they were so concerned that they were not elect. Um, they didn't know if they were elect or not. You know, th that's a big issue. The antidote for assurance is to view your works, to view if you are elect. This is the first John model, like I mentioned earlier. It points you back to seeing the fruit of your life, the fruit of your works. So the fruit of your work and what you've done, you look at instead of Christ and his finished work on the cross. You look to yourself and not the rest of God's grace and mercy. And, and you look to yourself and not rest on God's grace and mercy and the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's what we have. But when you believe on that you are elect, there's a big issue there. Biblical counseling. Now, I want to say this. Very much like apologetics, where they don't emphasize on soteriology and they don't emphasize on Calvinism. Uh, biblical counseling is kind of like a, the same vein in that. Well, you, a lot of biblical counselors are Calvinists and the founder, Jay Adams, as you see here on the screen, was a Calvinist. So you're going to see that woven within some of the writings that many Calvinists have. Another avenue that has permeated the landscape greatly from a reform position is the growth of biblical counseling. And again, when you see good things coming from Calvinists, you see God's grace in some of this stuff, right? It, like this is this is good that they're that this is becoming a forefront. I have greatly, greatly valued. I've had a person ask, "What do you do about biblical counseling?" You know, from certification standpoint, when Jay Adams obviously was a Calvinist, you know, how do you wrestle with that if you're not a Calvinist? 
Well, I went through certification as a Calvinist and have since left Calvinism. My best understanding is from what I at least see through ACBC is that the doctrine of soteriology, how they have it, seems to be general enough that you could lean one way or the other, and it's not a mandate whether you need to be a Calvinist or not. And that's the way it really should be. I mean, there are faithful, faithful men and women that are doing counseling for the sake of helping uh, brothers and sisters in Christ. You should not have the, like, oh, you have to be a Calvinist in order to be a counselor. That is nowhere in scripture that communicates that. That would completely go against Romans 15, 14. So while I believe soteriology is not a great part of the landscape of biblical counseling, other than the model is to share the gospel if someone shows or expresses to not know Christ, If they do profess and show a desire to pursue righteousness and repentance, then it is a sanctification focus, which is a lot of what biblical counseling is. If you're not, if you believe that you're counseling someone who's not a Christian, you need to focus on the gospel. The greatest need that they have is the gospel. So preach the gospel to them. That's the model. If they are a Christian, they profess Christ. You know, you you take them at their word that they are a Christian, and you focus on bringing them back to the word, so that the word is what actually helps and transforms them. Jay Adams, the man who is referred to as the one who founded the movement or the resurgence of using the Bible to help Christians was a Calvinist. So I just, you know, just be aware that there are going to be those undertones in some of what you read from his material and many others as well. You're taught how to read the Bible. Calvinism is not arrived to from just reading scripture. No one that I am aware of, and I would love for anyone to comment, has arrived to Calvinism because they've just read the scriptures. Most likely, it's been through the influence of a book, a commentary, a preacher, a teacher, a conference of some sort, which have speakers that are teaching Calvinism through what they are doing, okay? Once you see it, it's hard not to see it. That's the truth. People are not taught how to just read and understand in context. They are taught how to see Calvinism. People are not encouraged to be good Bereans and evaluate, here's the Calvinist position, here's the non-Calvinist position, which I think would be very healthy to do. But here is, I want you to be aware, this is how the Calvinist interprets the scriptures. I want you to be aware, this is how a non-Calvinist, contextually, historically, grammatically, brings out what the text says, and then where you're actually leaning on. In, In most cases, it's, this is what the scriptures teach, that's what it is. This is Calvinism. That's what it is. I understand we can't qualify everything because then you would be spending all your time qualifying stuff. But in many cases, there is the opportunity to do that. It needs to be something there. Whether it's done every Sunday, probably not a good thing, but it needs to be there within the church's ministry. I wholeheartedly believe that. They're encouraged to read other resources that are put together from Calvinist preachers and teachers. So the the emphasis that I've experienced is not go to the scriptures and learn, you know, go to Strong's Concordance, go to learning the the Greek and the Hebrew and learn for yourself what the scriptures are contextually communicating. Instead, go to these Calvinistic resources and learn from these men. These are men that we trust, learn from these men. And then just teaches you Calvinism. Many have not removed Calvinistic presuppositions and embarked on an open and humble exploration of the scriptures, which is what I am really admonishing everyone here to do. All right, here we go. My top three reasons why so many believe in Calvinism. And they are, number one, it sounds Christian, okay? Calvinism has to be taught. Calvinists use the same words, but they have different definitions. So that it sounds Christian, but they have a different interpretation of what those certain words mean. It's currently popular. So anything that is popular, just like the seeker sensitive movement had its day, and at the onset, before it got more time to have it fully vetted out, it seemed like, hey, this are some new approaches. People are trying to think outside the box to how to bring more Christians in. Over time, it established that it wasn't good, but you just give it time. And I think that's where we're at with Calvinism. A lot outside of Calvinism is true within the churches that hold to it. So just like apologetics, just like biblical counseling, these are good things, right? But that's not, (laughs) it's the Calvinistic part that's the issue. There are great orators within the movement. So great speakers, passionate speakers. It sounds Christian. They're proclaiming Christ, but they're proclaiming a Gnostic view 
of the scriptures. Number two, their argumentation is strong. So not only does it sound Christian, but they have a strong defense as to why they believe what they believe. They use a lot of philosophy to, d- to defend their position. They appeal to authority of current or past popular Calvinists. They appeal to their experience or their training that they have been in. And the non-Calvinists struggle to defend against Calvinism. So that's why ministries like Soteriology 101, Beyond the Fundamentals, and others emphasize a strong defense against Calvinism, a hermeneutical, exegetical approach against Calvinism. That's what this video is, these video series is also for, as well as to give you a non-Calvinistic view. There are biblical positions that are non-Calvinistic, but when you're in Calvinism, you think that Calvinism is the only way that, that the Bible is taught biblically and accurately. It's not true, but the defense is strong. The third point that I want to emphasize is fear. Now, hear me out. Check this out. If you look back on many of the points that I brought out, there's a common denominator for how many of the points that I have made, fear is the reason. Okay, fear in not getting the text right by leaving Calvinism. That was a fear of mine. I started seeing something. I'm like, am I getting the text wrong now that I'm seeing this differently? There was fear there. Fear of being a heretic. I I had that fear as well. Fear of not being one of the chosen elect. Again, if you are ingrained in that, you probably might think, oh, uh, am I not the chosen? Am Am I not one of the elect? As you start exploring this, doesn't just hit you. This is a compounding effect of over time you're doing this. So some people might greatly feel like they're not one of the elect as they're starting to see a non-Calvinistic interpretation of the scriptures. Fear that leaving Calvinism is leaving the gospel. Fear of not finding a solid church. One of the things that was told to me by others, like, what church are you going to go to? There's no other churches around here that I'm aware of that are going to be a good Bible teaching, preaching church. And so there was a fear. Where are you going to go? Where else is there a good church? Uh, There's fear. Fear that you might be wrong if Calvinism is not true. That was a fear. Could I be wrong past 10 years of my life that I thought something was true? It actually may not be true. There's a fear that comes in. Fear of what your friends will think. So fear of man. There's a fear your friends will still want to be your friends losing your circle of friends. There's a fear there. And sadly, that's what has been the result for for me and other people that I know. Alana L, who's on YouTube as well, I did a back and forth conversation with her on her YouTube channel, has experienced the same. There's been a just disconnectedness with people from the church. It's like this breaks apart. Like we're brothers and sisters in Christ that if you truly are in Christ, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. We're going to be in heaven together someday together, right? Because it's not a matter if you believe in Calvinism or not. It's, has the gospel saved you? Have you believed in the gospel? Have you put your faith and trust in him? That's what has saved you is God's mercy and grace granting you salvation as a result of believing the gospel. Calvinism is not the gospel. There will be Calvinists in heaven because they've put their faith and trust on Jesus, our Lord and Savior, okay? So we're going to be brothers and sisters in Christ, but now here we're separated here on earth because we believe in Calvinism or not in Calvinism. And it's, that's a sad, sad reality. Fear of walking away from deeper theology. Fear of walking into more heretical things like secret sensitive movements, word of faith, new apostolic reformation. You just you kind of get the sense that that's all that, that is out there. Prosperity gospel. I'm only going to find topical sermons now if I leave my Calvinistic church. Fear of walking away from what you have known to be the truth. Fear of throwing the baby out with the bathwater. <laughs> There's so many ways that could be ex- exploited and expounded upon. Fear of losing your salvation and deconstructing. A fear of missing out on pastoring a church that you've invested so much of your time committed to. People that you want to shepherd and that you have been shepherding. Fear of not having that opportunity anymore. That was the case for me. Fear of what this will do to your family, perhaps. Thankfully, this wasn't the case. All of you know, my wife and my kids did believe, but it was hard for them to leave the relationships they had built over this course of time. And so I know that is the reason why some people end up staying. Uh, Fear of the uncertain of whatever it may be. So whatever the uncertain thing is, I probably 
left out some things that could potentially impact you, fears that you might have. But fear, 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 fear is what has crept into all of this. And God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. And you know what actually cancels out fear? Perfect love cancels out fear. That's what the scripture tells us. And so the love for Christ, the love to follow the convictions, what we see in the word, and walking in obedience to him out of a desire to love and know him and to walk in the way in which he walks. That'll cancel out that fear. So that's my admonition to you, that if you are on this teeter-totter of not sure and you feel like maybe you are leaning to a non-Calvinistic perspective, just know perfect love casts out fear. I have a biblical counseling whole series on fear and how the Bible communicates how we are to be counseled from fear. So watch that video um, if you need to, because it may be needed if you are walking away from Calvinism. How Calvinism thrives. Calvinism seems to thrive when it's fighting off other heresies. The Protestant Reformation fighting against the Catholic Church, the rise of the prosperity gospel preachers and the seeker-sensitive movements. The devil here is misrepresenting God in both extremes. Calvinism is not the antidote for Catholicism. Calvinism is not the antidote for the prosperity gospel or seek your sensitive movements or the emergent church. That's not the answer. Christ is the answer. Jesus Christ is the answer. Biblical truth, biblical authority is the answer. In faith alone, in Christ alone, that's the answer. Why does this conversation matter so much? God's character and biblical accuracy, okay? I think the Calvinists would agree why this Cal why if we can agree on anything this does truly matter because we're both trying to defend God's character and biblical accuracy and biblical authority Satan is very crafty and he desires to twist the truth and to twist who God is and God's character did God really say whosoever believes will be saved did he really say that isn't God so much more sovereign when he controls every passing moment and all the details that are intertwined within isn't that how God is more sovereign the devil wants to take God's character and run it through the mill and he never does it some sometimes so blatantly that you it's obvious it's mixing a lot of truth with lies did God really say that you will surely die you know this is what Satan does and this is why this series greatly matters we all want to uphold God's character but we all need to be discerning against the schemes of the enemy the fact that historical records do not show proof of the Calvinistic lens on these doctrines until Augustine should in and of itself make you doubt significantly of its validity. That 400 plus years passed in the early church before these doctrines were brought out by Augustine from Manichaeanism, from Gnosticism, and that Augustine didn't even hold to that. Watch my first video on this and you'll, you'll hear more about this. And there's actually, there's so many more resources out there that go way deeper into understanding that mine, I feel like, is just scratching the surface on that stuff. It's just to really just be a, an entry level of understanding of why these doctrines have come in. Just know there are many more resources out there that I would strongly recommend. And so one of them, I'll just go, point number three is Augustinian Calvinism by Ken Wilson. There's a shorter version and a longer version. I mean, start with the shorter version. It's like 14 bucks or 15 bucks on Amazon. You can get that. I'm gonna leave a link in the description below. I strongly recommend that you understand where this Calvinistic theology was rooted from and where it came from. And so uh, it's Dr. Ken Wilson, you will do yourself a good service that if you don't understand the roots of this, you need to, you really do. Uh, Christian Theology by Adam Hardwood, phenomenal resource. He goes over all the different ways that Christians have theology. And he has a leaning on what he shows to be biblical, but he does a good representation of Calvinism throughout and where Calvinism is applicable. It's not just on Calvinism, it's obviously all the things that relate to Christian theology, but there is a aspect of Calvinism, and here is the Calvinistic worldview, and here is the non-Calvinistic worldview, and this is how different Christians believe and, and see different things that way. And he's not a Calvinist, so, so Adam Harwood, I would strongly recommend that purchase. The Extent of the Atonement by David Allen, massive book, expensive book, but I've got a buddy of mine, good 
brother in, uh, in Christ. I mean, solid Christian, but he is a he's a five point Calvinist. <laughs> he really holds to the fact that limited atonement is the the main driver for Calvinism. Like it is, like that is. If you don't believe it in limited atonement, then all the other things fall apart. And I do actually agree with that. If you don't believe in one of the five tenets, you're not being consistent in your theology because they have to go together. You can't have one without the other. You have to hold to all five to really be a Calvinist. And the extent of the atonement is, in his mind, the strongest argument for the Calvinistic position. So I would encourage you, read the extent of the atonement. You will be just greatly blessed by understanding it. Again, I'm not telling you convert out of Calvinism. I'm telling you to work through things so that you do know that you're in the truth. Be a good Berean. I'm not here to be the Holy Spirit for you. I'm here to tell you that there, that I've walked through Calvinism, wholeheartedly embraced everything within it, and then came to a different position as a result of reading through the scriptures. I don't think that's by accident. You have to conclude one of two things is the truth, is that either I walking away from Calvinism was aligning more with the biblical truth, or that God has predestined me to fall out of Calvinism if you hold to Calvinism. Because if God is sovereign and controls all things, he has purposed that I have fallen out of Calvinism. Okay, lastly, commentaries. I can't tell you how many commentaries there are that have Calvinistic theology brought into it. I've got a series, Navigating Biblical Interpretation, which is a whole kind of crash course of how to learn the Bible, how to study and interpret the Bible hermeneutically, all of that. And I can't tell you how many commentaries there are that have that systematic. One of those videos talks about you need to wait before you go to commentaries. You want to try to learn the scriptures to the best that you can. Uh, there's a lot of good Bible resources, you know, Olive Tree, Logos, Blue Letter Bible, and others that you can learn the Greek and the root words of all of that. You can read things in context, underline, and do all those things. You can do that. Go to the scriptures and try to chew on it first before you go to commentaries because commentaries can have theological bents to them and they may be right and they may not be right but you don't want to start there and then just start assuming that onto the text a great resource that i have found to be helpful especially from an outline perspective is the preacher's outline and study bible this will set you back a good bit if you get the hardcover versions of this. I don't I have the electronic versions of this. Olive Tree has been the best resource to get these. And usually twice a year, usually in the summer in July when they do Christmas in July sales and then around Christmas time, you can get these for $99 for the Old Testament, $99 for the New Testament. So you're going to at least spend $200 on this resource. But it's a phenomenal resource. It's not Calvinistic and it's a really good breakdown of the outline of the scriptures and then also gives commentary as well. Speakers, theologians, YouTubers that I recommend is John Lennox. He is not a Calvinist. Mike Winger might know him as Bible thinker. He's very popular. He has some videos on why he's not a Calvinist that I think are phenomenal. Frank Turek, who does cross-examined, he is not a Calvinist and he's he does apologetics, great resource. Leighton Flowers, Soteriology 101. But you might think, and I thought so too, I remember when I first heard of Leighton Flowers as I'm working through this. This is interesting. My initial thing is like, I remember James White, I think talking about Leighton Flowers. He's not a good guy. He's not someone that you should listen to. And again, when you're in Calvinism and you hear these Calvinistic people talk badly about certain people, you just then start assuming that they're bad and you shouldn't touch them with a 10-foot pole. Leighton is focusing on understanding soteriology, the doctrine of salvation, from a non-Calvinistic perspective. And he has got a many, many of great points that I would encourage you to listen to. Steve Gregg, I think he is a self-admitted Arminianist. Uh, so, so just be aware of that. He has a phenomenal debate, though, with James White that I think he just so clearly shows how Romans exposits the text and not it's not Calvinistic. And James White reverts to like just some it's just some funny things like he's just like, oh, are you talking to me? Like he skirts the issues that Steve is trying to bring against James White's position. There's name calling and stuff like that that 
that just like, oh, you're, you're, you're not being honest and things like that. Just ways to just push off answering the questions honestly. So just some things there. Jordan Hatfield, I hope to do something with him at some point, but he's got Great Lakes Studios. He emphasizes a lot on cults, other ways of Calvinism. I would recommend his resources as well. All right, so here is hard and honest questions that a Calvinist must answer. I really think that if you want to be honest with yourself, if you are a Calvinist, you do need to answer these questions. The burden of proof is on you to answer these questions honestly. And how does your position allow whatever the answers are that you you have for this? How do you know that you're elect? How do you, without proving your fruits of works, how do you know that you're elect? That is an answer that you need to ask yourself. Why did Jesus speak in parables? It can't be that Jesus was trying to keep the unregenerate from facing a greater judgment, which is something I've heard MacArthur say, because they would have no will to respond, no eyes to see, no ears to hear, unless God grants them regeneration. So in MacArthur's position, it's reserving them for stricter judgment. But if they can't see, if they're blind, if they're spiritually blind, they don't have ears to hear, then there is no level of understanding that they're going to have. They can't be reserved for a stricter judgment. That doesn't make any sense. If God needs to grant regeneration first to people, and he only does that to certain people, why would God try to hide something by using parables? Jesus proactively tells us, I'm telling you these things because I'm trying to give you the truth right now. There'll be a time when you can proclaim the truth to the world. But right now, I'm only teaching in parables. And the spiritually blind could not see unless they were given the ability to see. So Jesus is speaking in parables because the time was not fulfilled yet for all the people to know. Why did Jesus do it that way? I don't know, but I I do know that it's not because there was some level of understanding that they could have had that they might believe. I just know that Jesus was waiting until the fulfillment of his resurrection and then given the apostles to go proclaim the gospel to the world. But for whatever reason, he chose to do it that way. He did, but it wasn't to save people from a stricter judgment. That's not what it was. 2 Corinthians 4.4 talks about Satan blinding the minds of unbelievers so that they will not see the light of the gospel. Why would Satan need to blind those who are already spiritually blind? Why would he need to do that? Is this double blinding? Like, I don't understand. The Calvinist needs to answer that question using things like the killings and murders and rapes and everything else for his glory. Is Is that what we see God wants? Is that what we see who God is in the scriptures? Absolutely not. This is, this is what I talk about in my third video about the secret will of God. It's, it's dangerous theology. And what else would Satan want to do than to defame who God is and his character? So why would Satan need to blind those who are already blind? Makes no sense. Why does God call people to choose life and to humble themselves if they don't have the ability to do that? It's like God's dangling a carrot and he's saying, yeah, humble yourselves. But the only reason you can humble yourselves is if I give you the ability to humble yourselves. Like, is that who God is? Does he play games like that with us? Could it be that humans have the ability to actually humble themselves and that the will to do that is not what grants regeneration and and salvation? Like, I can humble myself. That in and of itself does not grant regeneration or salvation in any, okay? God still does 100% of the saving. I keep emphasizing that. Why would God command all men to repent, Acts 17.30, if they can't unless God aids them by granting regeneration? Again, God's playing games. Why do so many Calvinists struggle with assurance? Not all, but many. If God only saves some, the elect, isn't election what truly saves? and not the gospel and Christ's work on the cross? Seems like the gospel and Christ's work on the cross is just a means to the end of election. You got to answer that question. That's a, that's a very good question to answer. That's a very good question to answer. Why is there not one Bible verse, not one, that explicitly states that regeneration precedes faith? Why is there not even one? Why does Ephesians 1.13 tell us that we hear and believe before we are sealed with the Holy Spirit? We need to, you need to answer that question. 
If God tells us that his nature is that he cannot lie, then why would it appear he has a revealed will in scripture? All can come to Jesus. Jesus will draw all men to himself, whosoever believes, but he has this secret will that only the elect can come or will come. Why would God do that? Doesn't that make God a liar? Whosoever believes, I don't wish anyone to perish, but really I do because I'm only electing certain people to salvation. That's lying. God is not a liar. And so this whole aspect of there's a mystery, we just don't understand how God can be a liar and not be a liar is not true. Your position on the Bible is not true. The Calvinistic position is not true. It makes God a liar. If Calvinism is true, then every Calvinist should preach their version of the gospel with full transparency and proclaim that if you are the elect, then God will regenerate you first and then give you faith to believe and grant you repentance. Why hide this in your gospel proclamation if you truly believe it to be true? Why do you feel the need to withhold that transforming truth? If the blind have no ability to take off the blindfolds, then what's it to you if you just come out and say that Jesus may not have died for them? Or to say that Jesus may not have died for you? Or to say that you may be one of the elect if God has granted you repentance? I'll be praying that God grants you repentance. Friend, this is meant to be hard for the sake of love. I really, really want you to think about this. If you are a Calvinist, I really prayerfully want you to consider what you are holding on to. If you're a compatibilist, you need to examine yourself and ask these very hard questions. The hardest one being, could I be wrong? Could I be wrong? And if your answer to that is yes, or maybe, then I strongly encourage you to go to the scriptures and really try to with bring out the text as it's plainly there. We are to take the plain passages as they are plainly there. There's not some secret philosophy that's woven in behind what the passages are to mean. Like my third video started, it is of, of utmost importance to seek understanding from an unbiased position And see if by asking these hard questions, going to the scriptures and working out why do you disagree with the non-reformed position so much. And one of two things will happen. You will learn something or you will walk away more convinced in your original belief. So really my call to you is not to leave Calvinism. My call to you is to be a good Berean and actually try to see the scriptures from a non-Calvinist position. Truly chew on it. Truly, authentically, honestly, transparently look at the evidence that is there and then contrast it to what you understand in Calvinism. You will learn something, guaranteed, and or you will be more convinced that Calvinism is true. So in the long term, you will actually believe. Another point I should make is this, is that if you are a Calvinist and you're throwing these slanderous like heretic and all these other things at me, just know that you in your position, God has ordained me to be this heretic. And so you really shouldn't be going at me. You really should be going after God because, or you should, you should not be really trying to stand up for this, you know, and thinking that I'm going to sway people the other way because if God has truly elected people to salvation, all who he has elected will be saved. There's nothing that I can do or anyone can do from a heresy perspective that's going to persuade someone to not be the elect. So really the heresy is just going to be in the pool of all the other heretics. So there's no need for you to get upset about anything that you believe is heresy. There really isn't. I think that's the cognitive dissonance. Let me say this, is that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. In Calvinism, you are regenerated first, arbitrarily chosen to be regenerated and given spiritual life first. Do you see what's wrong with this? So in other words, God the Father pre-selects life, 
salvation, regeneration to come to the elect and then places you in Christ. But wait, that means that Jesus is not the resurrection and the life. Election is. Because election is what gave you the life. God's election on you is what gave you the life. The Calvinist Ordo Salutis declares that regeneration is given first, then faith to believe on Christ, so that you are saved and placed in Christ, adopted into the family of God. That is not what the Bible teaches. The Bible says Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Whosoever comes will have eternal life. Do you see this? In the Calvinistic perspective, election is salvation, not Jesus. Philosophical Gnostic belief of predestination is salvation, not Jesus. Brothers and sisters, my heart is heavy for you that if you are in Calvinism, that you are believing much that is false about who God is, what the Bible communicates, and while I want to uh, commend so many Calvinists for being faithful and biblical in so many other ways, I think that there is a tie to elements of falsehoods, false understandings, false presuppositions on what the Bible clearly communicates. And if we really, really, really break it down, it is heresy that needs to be condemned and it needs to be put away. I think any Christian would say that anything that is not true in the word, we should not adhere to it. So that's why this is such a big deal, is that Calvinism is either true or it's not true. It can't be this middle ground. It is either true or it's not. That might mean that you need to start working through all the different positions and understandings and doctrines and theology of Reformed doctrine of doctrines of grace. All the five points need worked out. All of this needs worked out. My admonition to you is that it, it would be, it is a worthy endeavor to wrestle with the scriptures in this particular area because God's character matters. Our obedience to the word matters. Our faithfulness to get the text right greatly matters. My call to you is to go be a faithful Berean. With that, I'm closing this video out and also closing this series out. And I want to thank you so much for your love and support. I look forward to your comments and responding to them. Thank you so much for being a subscriber. And if you're new here, I would love for you to subscribe as well. I pray the Lord just has you in your journey as you work through all of this and your exploration of it. May God grant you peace and joy as you seek to know him more. Thank you so much. God bless.